E ngā mana, e ngā reo, koutou kua hui hui mai nei, ka nui taku mihi ki a koutou. Uh, let's start our hui today with karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Kia ora koutou and welcome to our webinar today where we ask how can good social policy create the conditions for social connection to thrive. Ko Mandari Tuku Ingoa, kei te mahi au i Burl, he kairanga hau a hau. So I'm Amanda, I work at Burl as a senior researcher. Uh, te mea tūtahi, first thing, just a little Zoom housekeeping. We'll be using both the chat and the Q&A functions. You'll see the Q&A function on your uh, Zoom toolbar at the bottom right. And the chat function is second from the left next to the participants um, little icon. We'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A to ask questions of our panelists and to look at questions that others are asking. If you're interested in the answers to any questions that are already listed, you can hit like and that will help us to prioritise when we come to the Q&A section of our time together. We'd also like to encourage you to use the chat function and this is to kōrero, to add any web links uh, and to ask any technical questions like if you're having any Zoom issues. Uh, that chunk chat function and the Q&A function will be monitored, so we'll make sure that we're able to uh, answer and respond to those. So panellist questions in Q&A and technical questions and kōrero in the chat function. And I know, I'd like to introduce Holly Walker. Uh, Holly is Deputy Director and WSP Fellow at the Helen Clark Foundation. She has a background in social policy, politics and communication. So Holly was previously principal advisor at the Office of the Children's Commissioner and before that a Green MP from 2011 to 2014. Holly, kia ora e hoa. Kia ora Amanda, um, ngā mahi nui ki a koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, no ingarangi mi koti rana o kutipuna uh, i tipu au i raro i te rau kura o te ata ati awa i pito oni, ko Holly Walker tōku ingoa. Uh, e mihi ana ahau um, ki te kaupapa o Mahuru Māori, no reira tēnā koutou katoa. And kia ora Amanda for that introduction and for lending your facilitation skills to this important kōrero today. Uh, I know you're all here mostly to hear from our panellists, so I won't take up too much of your time, but I would like to briefly introduce uh, the research that sits behind today's conversation about how public policy can foster social connection uh, and why we wanted to co-host this webinar with um, Burl and WSP. So um, as Amanda said, I work for the Helen Clark Foundation. We're an independent public policy think tank committed to advancing the values of fairness, uh, sustainability and democracy that have driven the career of our patron, Helen Clark. Um, and I came on board in January of this year as a result of a partnership between the foundation and WSP New Zealand. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with WSP, it's a professional services um, firm with a, a focus on uh, transport engineering in the built environment and a long history in Aotearoa actually that goes right back to the original Department of Public Works. And WSP support of the foundation is part of its Future Ready initiative which aims to identify what the challenges are that we're going to face in the future and start designing for them now. Um, as well as that, we also have a working partnership with Burl, hence the three co-hosts today, and that sees us collaborate on reports and events, again of shared um, interest. Uh, the first output of this partnership with Burl was a report called Engaged Communities, How Community-Led Development Can Increase Civic Participation, which we released late last year, and that's available on our website. So it's great to be working with both Burl and WSP on this event today. Um, with, the, with the support we have from WSP, I essentially am funded to research and write two reports each year on topics of shared interest. Um, and early on we identified loneliness as a potential topic of shared interest, um, even before um, 
we were all put into enforced social isolation. Um, but when we were, we rapidly bumped it up to the top of the list. So at the start of lockdown in March, um, I started researching the health and social risks of loneliness and how the pandemic might exacerbate them. Uh, and what we can do about it with our policy. So the result is this report, Alone Together. And I'd like to take you quickly through some of the highlights and key findings, because I think they'll inform uh, the panel discussion that we have today. So first of all, to um, define what we mean by loneliness, I think we all um, know what loneliness feels like, even if we can't put it precisely into words. We've all felt that particular pain or anguish of loneliness because we've all experienced it at some time in our lives. But in terms of a technical definition, at its core, it's really just an unmet need for connection. So it's when the opportunities for connection in our daily lives either are not numerous enough or they're not meaningful enough to meet our very human need to connect with other people. It is a very normal part of the human experience to feel lonely sometimes, but when it becomes chronic and prolonged, it can be very harmful. Um, it can also occur at any time of our life, although it does seem to be most prevalent at moments of major life transition. So, for example, when we leave home for the first time, perhaps when we become parents for the first time, or when we retire. I think a really important thing to note is that while they are related, loneliness and being alone are not the same thing. So somebody can live alone and, and perhaps rarely see other people, but not feel lonely if their needs for connection are being met in other ways. Or they can be constantly in the company of other people, but feel really intensely lonely um, because despite being surrounded by people, their, connect, their, their needs for connection are not met. So the causes are different for everyone and so are the solutions. Um, and I think a critical thing to think about too is the fact that having a lot of connections with other people, while it can help um, buffer against the risks of loneliness, research does suggest that it's really the quality rather than the quantity of our social connections that have the biggest impact. Why is loneliness important? Um, why is it matter for public policy? So it is a it is actually a significant um, health and social issue, um, partly for an evolutionary reason. So humans are social animals. We evolved to live in groups and rely on each other to, for survival. So even to this day, if we perceive ourselves to be in some way separated from the group or left out, um, it can trigger an automatic threat response in the brain, like the fight, flight or freeze response we're all familiar with. And while that's a useful response when we're in immediate danger, because it makes us more alert and poised for action, when we stay in that zone long term, it has various physical um, implications, over, over activates various physical systems. Uh, systems in our body. So it can create hormonal imbalances, it can disrupt our sleep, it can elevate feelings of panic and urgency, and these can also become self-reinforcing in a negative cycle. So a lack of sleep contributes to depression, uh, it also contributes to a weakened immune system, making us more vulnerable to infection, um, and so we, get, we can end up in a cycle of deteriorating health and well-being if our um, needs for connection are not met over time. And over, over a longer period of time, essentially this accelerates the process of ageing. So people who report feeling lonely long term are more likely to experience cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, dementia, hormonal imbalance. And, and studies have found clear links between self-reported loneliness and shorter life expectancy, as you see in that quote, indeed linking it um, even to a similar effect to, to that of heavy smoking. So it is a um, it does present a significant public health challenge. Uh, in our report we had a look at data from the 2018 General Social Survey to understand who is most likely to feel lonely and we found some really clear um, and perhaps surprising um, evidence about who about who feels most lonely or who's most likely to feel lonely. So amongst those um, who were most likely to report feeling lonely most or all of the time were people who were unemployed. Um, people who lived on very low income or in low income households, uh, people who were sole parents, um, Māori were in that group, um, and also young people. So briefly, uh, why? I think um, it's important to sort of dig into a little bit to why these groups might report feeling more lonely. In terms of employment, I think uh, work 
um, for many of us, provides a really important social network as well as our income, of course, um, and provides many of the crucial day-to-day -day interactions and relationships that inform our lives. And also, for many of us, it's also a really important source of personal identity and purpose, so it contributes to that feeling of belonging or connection of being part of something. Um, and when we don't have it or when we lose it suddenly, that can really trigger uh, those feelings of loneliness. Of course, income or, uh, employment also provides income, which itself is very clearly linked to loneliness. Um, the lower your household income, the more likely you are to feel lonely. It's very, uh, it's very stark. So I think poverty creates barriers that hinder the formation and maintenance of social relationships in a couple of different ways. Firstly, through the pervasive toxic stress that it creates um, in our lives and indeed in our bodies. And secondly, through the lack of access to resources like free time to socialise or funds for travel and recreational activities. So it makes it really difficult to maintain our need for connection if we're living in the stress of poverty. Um, household type is a really significant factor. Um, couples actually with no children are the least likely to report feeling lonely, which is interesting. Um, but sole parents and those who live outside of a nuclear family, so in particular those who live alone, are more likely to feel lonely. Um, so I would suggest that um, part of an effective public policy re response to loneliness needs to consider the needs of these groups in particular. Um, ethnicity, Māori were among those most likely to report feeling lonely and um, our, I, we hypothesise that this is um, likely due at least in part um, but probably in large part to the negative impacts of colonisation and the historical inequities that Māori have experienced including the fragmentation of collective ways of living and of course um, the ongoing impacts of racism uh, in, in, our, in Aotearoa today. Uh, Perhaps one of the most important takeaways is around age. So I think in a lot of our popular discourse about loneliness, we tend to focus on it as an issue for older people. Um, but older people are actually the least lonely age group. By a huge margin, it's young people aged 15 to 24 who report the highest levels of loneliness. And I think that's something we really need to take seriously in our efforts to tackle the problem. Um, it's not part of the narrative currently, and, and it should be. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take elderly loneliness seriously, especially for older people who are living alone. And you can see in that chart there, when you get over the age of 75, um, people's self-reported loneliness does start to increase a little bit. But it's still um, much, much less than, uh, than younger people who are the most likely age group to feel lonely. Um, just briefly on how the pandemic may have impacted on our loneliness. So we compared that survey from 2018, where the previous um, data came from, with, some, with a survey conducted by researchers at Victoria University during the lockdown. And not surprisingly, there was a very significant spike in self-reported loneliness during the lockdown, uh, with those who are already vulnerable, so in the groups I just talked about, being significantly uh, most affected. So you can see from that chart, the yellow bars are the baseline from 2018 and the orange bars are how people felt um, during the lockdown. And you can see for some of those groups, th these are people who said they felt lonely most or all of the time, a really significant jump. Obviously, the level four lockdown was a while ago now. Um, this survey was followed up at the first time we were in level two. Um, those reports haven't been, uh, those results haven't been reported yet, but I think it will be really interesting to see how um, loneliness is tracking in lower alert levels and also the next general social survey is due soon. So it will be really important, I think, um, to continue to monitor people's levels of loneliness and connection on an ongoing basis. Uh, internationally, there is some evidence of loneliness levelling off since the initial lockdown and even in some places a positive effect on loneliness. Um, people posit that that's because people have been pulling together and focusing on um, the, that we're all in this together, he waka eki noa. Um, at, but, and that may well be true, but I suspect it's probably only true at the population level. I think we need to be very alert to how those who are most, get, most at risk are faring, and particularly those without access to digital technology, because one of the main ways we've buffered loneliness during the pandemic is by connecting online, as we are all doing right now. Um, and so for those who don't have access to that, um, they may be left out of that positive effect. <laughs>
Um, just one more slide, um, which looks at the solutions and leads into the corridor from our panelists today. So um, ultimately, what works to reduce loneliness and foster connection is more frequent and especially more meaningful social interactions with other people. And obviously what that looks like differs for everyone depending on their culture and their family and their community values and preferences. So it's not something that decision makers or policy makers can easily influence directly. But what we can do is create the conditions that allow meaningful social interaction to flourish. And in our report, after reviewing the evidence, we identified six planks of an effective policy response, and those are here on this slide. Today, we're here to talk about three of those, and we've um, chosen panelists who can really bring some depth uh, um, and expertise to, the, to, to these areas. So I'll just briefly introduce the three areas that we'll focus on. The first is making sure that people have enough money. So as I said before, loneliness is very clearly linked to income. And given that many people have lost both income and employment um, as a result of COVID-19, I think ensuring that they have a sufficient stable income will be really cr critical to buffer not only the economic recession, but also what we might call the social recession or the high levels of loneliness and isolation uh, that people may be feeling. The second is closing the digital divide. So we talked before about how much we've relied on digital technologies during the lockdown um, to buffer against loneliness, but there are still some 200,000 households, more than 200,000 households in New Zealand with no internet access and many others without access to affordable data or Wi-Fi. So uh, that's a real barrier um, for those who are uh, not who don't regularly have access to technology um, and finally creating friendly streets and neighborhoods so we know that communities really thrive when people know their neighbors and when they feel a sense of belonging and connection and those thriving neighborhoods require conscious planning to prioritize social well-being things like prioritizing walkability social interaction common space and easy access to parks and green space um, so when we're thinking about planning our, um, our streets and neighbourhoods and our houses and communities of the future, I think we really need to be thinking about how we foster connection in those places. Uh, I won't talk about the other three because they're not the focus of our conversation today, but I'm really excited to hand back now to Amanda to introduce our panellists and we can dig into these uh, topics in some detail. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Holly. Thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce our panellists today. Uh, Karinya Fahunati is an experienced architectural graduate at WSP with a strong appetite for social design. In 2017, she founded Mao Studio, a social design movement that set out to make the practice and education of architecture more accessible. Uh, Karinia is an assistant lecturer at the Victoria University uh, of the Victoria University of Wellington School of Architecture, um, as alongside her role at WSP and the advisor to Mao. Kia ora, Karinia. Uh, Max Rashbrook is a Wellington-based writer with twin interests in economic inequality and democratic renewal. He's currently the 2020 JD Stout Fellow at Victoria University of Wellington, uh, and he is the author of Government for the Public Good. The Surprising Science of Large-Scale Collective Action, and that was published by Bridget Williams Books in September 2018. Kia ora, Max. Uh, and lastly, uh, Anna Prendergast. Anna is a Wellington-based analyst, writer, and co-founder of Antistatic, a communications and research group um, with a focus on in the environment, technology, and social impact. Anna recently co-authored a chapter on digital inclusion in the 2020 book, Shouting Zeros and Ones, Digital Technology, Ethics and Policy in New Zealand. And that was also published by Bridget Williams Books. Uh, kia ora, Anna. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to ask a question of Karenia. Um, the government has injected billions into physical infrastructure investment as part of the COVID-19 response packages on top of increased funding through the PGF and the last two budgets. A Build Back Better approach considers community resilience and sustainability in any recovery measures following a disaster. But this pandemic is not a physical disaster, it's a social one. 
So how can social and community wellbeing goals be included as part of a build back better response in our new normal? Kia ora, Amanda. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on the panel. Um, it's a great question and I think uh, given the, you know, the situation that we're in now um, with where I'm standing, you know, I'm, I'm in a position of um, a, a designer. So we essentially have this influence on the built environment and quite often um, we will never meet the people that we design for, especially in our, at WSP, we're often designing public infrastructure and buildings. And so something that's really important um, in, in answering that question is that um, we, we've got to take a lead. And it's really interesting hearing Holly's um, research and, and her policy recommendations is that we've got to really latch on to um, those recommendations and say, as part of our design for public infrastructure and public buildings, we've, we've got to make our own criteria. And this criteria could be above and beyond what the government's already kind of specifying. For example, shovel ready. Um, I, I understand it's, it's all about construction readiness. It's about whether it has a public regional benefits, whether it's um, providing employment benefits. So that's all really good stuff. Um, but what is the additional criteria that's missing here? And from where I'm standing, it's things like, you know, what are the additional social benefits of these projects? Who is it actually targeting? And does it align with research? Does it align with the data that says people between the ages of 15 and 25 are experiencing increased loneliness? So I think from a designer's point of view, whether we're engineers or architects, we've got to really think about this bigger picture stuff. It's no longer just sitting at the table with our clients and saying, what do you need? It's actually doing our, more of our own research to say, actually, our client, you might want to look at this as well. Thank you for that. Um, now I'd like to ask Max a question. Um, Max, if we look at some of the living standard framework social capital indicators over the past five to 10 years, loneliness has been increasing and social connection, life satisfaction and sense of purpose have been decreasing. Uh, poor social bonds damage people's well-being and without support from family or friends, people are more likely to struggle in or worse drop out of the labour market. But what is the relationship between poverty, inequality, and loneliness? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Amanda. Great question. Kia ora koutou. Um, I guess, you know, poverty is often the thing that one of the social problems that most concerns us. But I guess a focus on inequality sort of puts poverty in the, the wider context of where is income and wealth distributed across the whole country. And, and I guess it says, well, you can't understand poverty without understanding wealth. So, for instance, you know, one of the big trends in New Zealand in the last 30, 40 years is that more of um, company income goes to the owners and shareholders, goes to capital, and less of it going to staff, going to workers. So that, you know, an increase of wealth for some people is part of what's responsible for the increase in poverty. For others, or um, you think about the fact that we we tax income pretty thoroughly in New Zealand. All of us pay, you know, tax on the very first uh, dollars of our income, but we've chosen not to tax wealth. Um, so some people don't have the same tax obligations, and that is part of the reason why we often lack the tax revenue to provide better social services that would support people and compensate them uh, for their disadvantage. So I look at all of this and sort of, you know, in that terms of inequality, um, but obviously the manifestation of inequality that we're most concerned about with this discussion is poverty. Um, and as Holly has so rightly highlighted, you know, people who are poor, are, you know, disproportionately lonely alongside people who are unemployed, Māori, young people. And, and I guess that's, you know, and, and that's a very depressing finding, but, but not a surprising one in the sense that, you know, in New Zealand we have, I mean, crudely speaking, what you might call absolute poverty, people being unable to just afford very basic things like 
heating their house, people who are switching off the refrigerator to save money on the power bill, um, people who can't afford to clothe their children adequately, um, all these kinds of things. And that's maybe very crudely speaking, one in 10 families of whānau in, in New Zealand. On top of that, you know, there's very crudely maybe another one in 10 families who are living in what you might call relative poverty in the sense of just not being able to afford the things that other families have and not being able to feel like they participate and belong in the society in which they live. Um, you know, and, and those issues about, about belonging are, are so crucial because again, as Holly said, you know, we are, we're social animals you know, and we feel fundamentally deprived of a basic aspect of our humanity if we can't take part in that wider society. And I remember once a few years ago interviewing a, a solo mother talking about how she and her daughter were both massive rugby fans, but they couldn't really go out and watch rugby games uh, because they couldn't afford the price of a jug of beer between them, you know, so they couldn't go to rugby club rooms, they couldn't go to a bar. Um, and you see that, you know, in so much of the data, there's so many families who say, you know, they can't afford, for instance, really to, to buy birthday presents for their children's friends. And they certainly can't afford to host a birthday party, uh, even for their own children, you know, do the catering for that. But that in turn means they often don't feel that they can let their children go to other children's birthday parties because they know they can't reciprocate. Um, and people in the comments have been raising issues around things like period poverty, which of course is connected back to that basic income poverty. So you can see how a lack of income has all these really profound effects on loneliness. And I think in that context, it's really great to see um, Holly's work highlighting this and recommending things like a guaranteed minimum income, which I think would go a long way to resolving some of these issues. Mm, kia ora, Max. Poverty in New Zealand is quite sobering, uh, really. Um, so, Anna, uh, just moving on to you, as, as Holly mentioned, over 200,000 homes in Aotearoa don't have internet access. And during the lockdown and subsequently, there's been a rapid move to bring everything online, our work, our social lives, education. But for those on the other side of the digital divide, the assumption that everything can be done online adds another level of exclusion and inequality. So how do we ensure social inclusion for those who are digitally excluded and at greater risk of experiencing loneliness? Kia ora, Amanda. That's a really great question. And I think um, what Max and Karinia have just said also links into this really well. So in terms of digital exclusion, there's people that both don't have access to the internet, like um, Holly and Max, uh, others have said. So it's about one in five people in New Zealand, at least, who are not digitally included. So that's either access, maybe not have the skills to use the internet or different uh, digital devices, also have the trust or the motivation or a reason to go online. Um, and of course, at the moment, most of us have a reason to kind of engage with the digital world, especially as more things, as you say, are going online. Um, and I think that one of the interventions that would really make a big difference here is Max just mentioned is make sure people have enough money. So one of the big barriers um, around digital inclusion is access. And yes, you can give people computers, you can make sure that they have um, an internet connection in their home that's paid for, that's great. But giving people the agency to choose how they interact with the digital world is really, really important. Um, it would just, you know, if you had to make an intervention like for people getting around or traveling and you just gave everyone the same car without thinking about their needs or what they wanted or how they were going to interact, it would be kind of a, a pretty average intervention. So I think that giving people the agency to pick uh, what devices they want to use, how they connect to the digital world um, and ensuring they have enough money to do so would be a really good way around that. Um, and I think also ensuring that the digital world, for lack of a better word, is designed in a way that works for people. Um, so loneliness in young people, um, was a, a, and I read the report that Holly wrote, was a huge thing for me. I didn't kind of expect that. And a lot of younger people are digitally included. They do know how to use digital technologies. They might have access, but there's also a real risk in that, that if you're lonely and you do go online, there is a risk that maybe you would be pushed towards uh, radicalization. Um, if you find people in fine community that 
doesn't push you in kind of a, a, a a direction that kind of reflects wider values. So I think that ensuring that uh, platforms are built in a way that don't push you down rabbit holes or that uh, services are designed for disabled people so people can engage with uh, the world in the way they want is a really important one as well. And that kind of links into what Karinya was saying about designing the physical world for people. You also need to design the digital world. Right. Accessibility, both of spaces, um, digital spaces and physical spaces, are really key part of this uh, this puzzle. Um, just before we ask uh, questions of all the panelists, I just want to remind everyone to uh, check out the Q and A function, ask some questions, and and see the questions that are already there. Um, and vote or, or like on the questions that you'd like to see uh, see the answers to. So a question for, for all the panelists, what are the barriers that stand in the way of uh, optimum social capital? I, think, I see thinking faces. <laughs> Well, I guess if I could have a have a brief stab at answering that question, I mean, I mean, predictably, I guess I would say inadequate income. Um, but I also I think, you know, well functioning communities again, as as Holly has highlighted, uh, are so important for connection and loneliness. But what what often you know when you look at particularly the communities that are you know on low wages that are they're in poverty. Very often they're affected by things like um, precarious work and shift patterns and things like that. And if you're, you know, if you're in the kind of situation where you're being rostered on a lot of very unpredictable shifts, you can't really even commit to things like, um, you know, coaching a rugby team or something like that. You know, something that will get you involved in your community, something that would have you connected with other people. Um, and there was a question that someone put up about, you know, how do we make sure that social sector um, funding goes to the people who are working on the front line, uh, often on minimum wages? And again, there'll be often people who are in communities where there's a lot of loneliness. Well, again, I think that's about, you know, commitment to decent work, you know, to work hours that people can control, that leaves them free to be, you know, good members of their community to build up that kind of social capital. And also, you know, to have a pay rate that means they don't have to work all kinds of hours. And so for me, that's partly about government. You know, it's committed to paying the living wage amongst its core employees. But, you know, would like, it'd be good to see that commitment to the living wage pushed out right across all the contractors, all the devolved groups, all the charities and firms that contract to government in the front of me actually really do government work in order to allow people to have better working lives and therefore build up more of that social capital. Uh, kia ora, Max. Uh, does any of the other panellists, Anna or Karinia, have any thoughts around that? Uh, I think Max did a really great uh, job at answering that question, so I'm just going to leave that one there. Uh, I'll just add um, briefly, just just on that, it, um, from a personal point of view, it's, it's, it is very much about income. You know, we, we need money to live and we need money to live at, a, you know, an acceptable standard of living that we we all know is there's a you know there's a baseline um, and I think that baseline is very blurred in New Zealand um, in terms of what is actually acceptable and it's very different depending on who you talk to and um, for example like I'll I'll use an example that I'm aware of is in public transport. The the idea of subsidy, the word subsidy is used quite interestingly. So if you're purchasing a, I don't know where everyone is, but in Wellington, if you're purchasing a monthly pass, that's subsidized or a yearly pass, that's subsidized. But the, the people who are able to afford that are, are those with the, you know, that are able to spend 500-ish dollars why and so what's happening is that people with a 10 trip pass this is very specific by the way a 10 trip pass um, are paying actually way more than what 
a, a person who's you know who forked out the the full amount so and i know in other countries you know the way that they've tackled that is um if you're buying a 10 trip pass and you you've reached your um the same value of a year pass you stop paying so it's just a shift in in that kind of thinking in in terms of um everyday um spending everyday kind of activities that we need to do on a, in, in life and i think it, it's different across sectors but that's just something that i've that i'm um yeah that i've noticed yeah and could i could i just briefly add to to that point i think corinne is really right to to say that there is this sort of a blurred concept in, in new zealand often about what what is the acceptable sort of minimum you know set of things that people need to live well and just uh one thing I've noticed from research in the UK is that, you know, if you just sort of vox pop um, people, their sort of top line response is often pretty um, sort of narrow in the sense of, oh, you know, as long as you've got a roof over your head, you're not poor. You know, that, that's people's initial response. But if you do what's actually, what you call a deliberative process, like you get people together and get them to discuss it really deeply and listen to the stories of people who are experiencing poverty, what happens is people shift out of that narrow view and they start thinking about what would I need to not be poor. And in the UK research, you actually end up getting quite significant consensus after discussion around the fact that to not be poor, you have to be able to afford to visit sick relatives in hospital, for instance. You know, you have to be able to afford those transport costs. You have to be able to afford to have a hobby is one of the things that people say after they've been given a chance to discuss it which is so different to what, you know, most people would say on the street. So I think, you know, I'd like to, there's, a, there's, a, there's room for actually a better discussion about what do people need to thrive and be connected and, and not be lonely. Well, can I just add one last thing to that? And I think in terms of, if you look at that around the digital world, for lack of a better word as well, um, the internet is often seen as this add-on as well. One of the things down lower on the list that you might want after you've paid for your housing and your food. But at the same time, I don't think we're living in a world that's separate physical and digital anymore. Everything is just the world and uh, the internet and the services built on top of it are so part of our day-to-day -day life now that if you don't have access to those, you can be at a huge disadvantage for finding a job or finding employment, um, a house, all of those things, maybe missing out on important emails if um, government departments aren't sending out uh, paper letters and things anymore. So um, again, digital is often seen yeah as, as an add-on when it really should just be a, a kind of an integral part of functioning in the, in the world those are some great points because we you know it, there's there's something around the what are the systemic barriers that are in place that contribute to the ongoing inequality and lack of accessibility uh, so if we think about policy what policy decisions would be good to focus on? Well, uh, I guess I could, could have first crack at that as well. Um, no one else is jumping into the breach. Um, look, I mean, I'd, I'd just really like to endorse um, the reports focus on a guaranteed minimum income, um, which in a sense is you know, I guess you could say is a, is a would be a much more generous version of the current benefit, but without, you know, all the sort of the conditions and stigmas and means testing and things attached. Um, and I mean, the thing I like about the guaranteed minimum income is that, you know, there's a really profound statement about what kind of society we want to live in and what we want for other people. Basically, it says, you know, there is there is a basic level of income and a reasonably generous one. And therefore, a basic standard of dignity and a basic standard of belonging and participation below which we will not allow other people to sink. You know, and that's a really profound statement, I think, about that we can make as a country about people whom we have never, other people we, we have never met and whom we will probably never meet. Um, and, you know, and the, and the, but the guaranteed minimum income basically says, you know, if, if you don't have income from other sources, from, you know, conventional work in the marketplace, but you know, you could be volunteering, could be caring for children, uh, you could be caring for elderly people. The work's classically done by women. You know that is still really valuable. 
uh, you should be rewarded for doing that. Um, and we're going to concentrate, you know, our support on those types of people and really ensuring they have that kind of income level they need to be able to participate in their communities. I totally agree with that. And I think that, again, from a digital perspective, a lot of the kind of access issues around being able to afford the internet and getting devices, um, which is one of the key elements to being able to be digitally included. If, if people were not living in poverty, that would be a huge way to address that. Um, and we wouldn't need kind of top level interventions. But at the same time, I think the suggestions that were made in the Holly's report are, are really great um, for the kind of digital aspect. And it'll, putting Wi-Fi and internet and then having to pay those monthly costs in uh, state provided housing would be make a huge difference because I think that that's addressing uh, some of the groups that might not be able to afford that normally and that's just built in. Um, I think Bitsy interventions around digital inclusion has often been done which is great because they make a big difference but if we could do uh, something that kind of takes a big chunk at that service level intervention as well as addressing uh, making sure people have enough money that would be great. Yeah, and from a um, public infrastructure or um, built environment uh, point of view, it, it's really just looking at taking stock of what the minimum building standards are right now. And we talk about building standards, but it's so much wider than that. Um, a lot of us will be aware of the scathing report that came out of Christchurch um, this week about the, the lack of urban design and um, it just basically good design of, of a lot of the housing that's going on in, in Christchurch. And so just that as an example is how are we letting these get through? How are we letting these, um, you know, these designs and these, these public um, kind of facing uh, buildings get through in order, f you know, and, and being part of our built environment, it's, we, sh we always need to look at buildings that enhance well-being, not the other way around. And so Holly Walker's, um, a lot of her research really touches on that, is that the, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis designing it, it we've, we've got to start scrutinizing it from, from what's happening today. What does a COVID-19, a post-COVID-19 or a current COVID-19 world look like for our built environment? Kia ora. They really the, the considerations of working holistically and considering all the different consequences of policy decisions is, um, you know, what I'm kind of hearing. And also the uh, having a bigger plan, considering how all of these different policy decisions connect, uh, connect together. Uh, so if I go to the Q&A box, we have a Q&A uh, question here from Sarah. Um, who uh, ask us if we're able to comment on any reported reasons or causes of loneliness. I mean, Holly's research showed the, the groups that were more likely and some of our panelists have touched on any reasons. Um, but Sarah notes as a context, um, we know that lack of period products are directly, um, are directly attributed to feelings of loneliness, isolation and negative self feelings usually as a result of catalysts of poverty. So do, do any of the panellists have any thoughts around um, the, the causes or reasons aside from demographics and income? Should I, should I jump in as the, um, as the loneliness person? Um, thank you, Sarah, for that question. I, um, I think it's a really important one because you're right um, to identify that. In some cases, I think in some cases I think risk factors are causes, and we've talked a lot about income and how yeah, living with insufficient income can itself be a cause of loneliness, and so can something like, for example, you know, losing employment um, or a sudden change in circumstances of some kind. Um, but but those. But by the same token, risk factors such as age don't necessarily cause you to feel lonely, but they can um, contribute in some way. So I think, I do think it, it will vary depending on each individual person. I think a big part of it is um, f for people who report profound feelings of loneliness, it's about, um, it's about 
not I think some of it is around not knowing that other people are going through the same thing so the, the effect of um, an unmet need for connection is you feel as though you are the only person who's feeling the way that you're currently feeling and that everybody else is feeling differently to you so if we think about young people for example in um, in social media this is something that comes up often is like uh, are digital technologies and is social media making young people feel more lonely or is it part of the solution to how they can feel less lonely? And I think the answer is both because um, it can have the effect of amplifying that feeling of going through something else or feeling differently from everybody else when you see um, images of, of friends or peers who look as though they are unaffected by these types of feelings um, and social media can very much amplify that but by the same token it can be a really excellent um, a really excellent tool for reconnecting with other people when it's used when it's employed appropriately so I think a big part of it is feeling alone and feeling as though nobody else is going through the same thing that that you're going through um, but yeah I do think it's really important um, to be aware of not stigmatizing. So for example, if we say Māori are more likely to feel lonely um, or young people are more likely to feel lonely, that doesn't mean it's by token of those aspects of their identity, but, but um, that it's worth considering how the solutions work for those groups of people um, to make sure that they're the right fit. Kia ora Holly. Uh, now, Max, I have a question here for you and, and perhaps the rest of the panellists. It's from uh, Paul. Um, kia ora. I'm all for reasonable minimum incomes, but um, he's interested in policies to lift the productivity of the economy. So better productivity is a source of higher average incomes. Um, so what, uh, to what extent is low productivity the cause of low incomes and therefore loneliness? In Aotearoa, and is this something that policy can help with? Oh goodness! Okay, great question. Although um, I have a horrible suspicion it's one of those questions that the person asking it knows more about uh, than any of the people on the panel, myself included. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I guess I would answer that by focusing in a bit on the stuff that I know about, which again is sort of around is around incomes and the quality of work and the nature of work and how, how we treat people within the workplace. I mean, the New Zealand's low productivity, I'm sure has a very, very large number of causes. But the one that always bothers me is that I think we have a disproportionately large number of New Zealand businesses who treat their workforce as quite expendable, um, who are, I mean, not necessarily always dreadful employers, but don't put a lot of effort into training their staff and that's reciprocated by their staff not sticking around for very long. And so you have a lot of churn and a lot of low paid work. Um, and we don't really have a good settlement, I think, in terms of, you know, funding the training of staff. Is that responsibility of businesses, the individual, government, or all three? And, you know, and we have an awful lot of very loose subcontracting, a lot of sort of massive chains of, you know, levels and levels and levels of sub contracting and a lot of people are just sort of easy come easy go from the point of view of their employers and while I don't think it would be a magic bullet um, I do think you know a set of sort of law changes that guarantee people greater stability in their work um, that try to sort of strengthen uh, working relationships um, and frankly just a cultural change of view on the part of, of employers um, in terms of value, seeing their workforce more as an investment rather than a cost, which I think is too often the case, you know, I think that would um, be one thing that would help productivity and it would also, you know, in terms of sort of improving the nature of work and the stability around it, also has some direct impacts on loneliness and people's ability to participate in their communities, which I touched on earlier. Kia ora, Max. Yeah, there, there are some um, consequences of seeing employees or HR as a cost as opposed to an investment. Um, I'm quite curious about how that reflects on turnover. Uh, so, Karinia, yeah, we have a question here um, around... Hang on, things moving. 
Um, oh, where did it go? It disappeared. Um, it was around the, oh, there we go, around the, uh, the requirement that was recently removed around car parks for, uh, in dwellings. Um, and just wondering whether this, uh, you think this will make a change in terms of the built environment um, to increase uh, accessibility, to increase uh, more friendly, create more friendly streets and neighborhoods. Um, and Yasir is wondering whether this would improve infrastructure around walking and cycling. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And I, um, it's an interesting one. So a lot of the, a lot of the uh, decisions around new developments, new apartments, you know, new um, medium, low density housing type thing without car parks is, is proposed by, you know, developers or, um, you know, urban design or architects. And what's, what's often missing in that piece of the puzzle is that, that's all well and good, but is the city that it's being proposed in, is it a walkable city? Is it a, is it a city where there is decent public transport to um, alleviate the, the need for a car? And so I think that's, that's where it's really, I, I get, I understand and fully support the sentiment behind it, you know, encouraging this, um, the, you know, minimizing cars on the road, but we need to kind of be collaborative across all sectors and, and work together to say that, you know, I don't need a car because I have a, a bus to ride, I've got a train, I've got a, you know, the, the, the streets are safe to walk. So yeah, it's, it's kind of needs to go hand in hand. And that's where that collaboration across all sectors is really important. And if we go even a step higher, it's like that's where the, the decisions around policy need to need to start kind of having those um, those understandings around you know these decisions that are being made on the ground and what it, what the implications are across um, across society really. Can I just just sort of briefly follow up on that? And this is more already another another question for Karinia. Because one of the things that strikes me is that, as with a lot of government projects, so many of the things that affect our urban form, you know, are still quite top down. And there's sort of lip service paid to the idea of involving the community, but it doesn't often really happen. Um, I've been reading a lot of work from Becky Kittle from the Vic School of Architecture talking about, you know, you never even see communities acknowledged on architecture awards as a contributor to this great architecture, even when they were. Um, and I hear all these fears about Eastern Porirua and the transformation that's going on there, and that's going to affect the community and potentially, you know, not increase the community's social cohesion um, or its social capital. I mean, do, do you see any good examples of where communities really are in charge of these urban projects? Or if not, what do we need to change? Yeah, that's a really good point, Max. And I think um, it's we're definitely not where we need to be on that. Um, and and I like to talk about the 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 concept of meaningful engagement. And it, that that word meaningful is really important there. Um, quite often in the past, it's been a tick the box, or it's been a oh that's right we need to consult with these people. Um, and it's it's slowly becoming, uh, in terms of government agencies that I'm personally working with, it's it's very much uh, at the forefront, um, and quite often it's actually at the development of the brief. Um, an example of that that's um, that I know is the uh, going really well at the moment is the City Rail Link project up in Auckland. So there is a mana whenua um, advisory group that they are mandated to kind of stop and start work. And, and that is, that's all about making sure that the right people are at the table. And also just distinguishing whose table it is, because that's a really big thing is actually like part of part, being able to, to engage uh, meaningfully is establishing who who is who like who is actually a really important part of this picture and you're right and especially in the architecture industry um it's very much a um you know quite often the client will be there at the awards ceremony or um and and oftentimes not that people 
who should be acknowledged um, are missed. And so that's very much, um, I, I can say that it's improving, but we've got some, some way to go there. Can I just add to that as well? I think that um, in terms of thinking about things digitally as well, the same kind of applies that when we're building services and the same with platforms and things, it's often Facebook is designed by a bunch of people who want to make money. And yes, it's a place that people might think of a public square or a place to work together and uh, make connections, but it's also important to make sure that the people are using it or the people that we want to benefit from it get a, a voice in how that um, things are set up. And also I'd add that I know in kind of digital projects where they get uh, meaningful engagement with people, you also want to acknowledge their time in different ways or know that often people that don't have capacity um, because they might be working really long hours or have family commitments to make sure that we can uh, figure out ways to get people to engage in these uh, processes and giving them um, either payment or uh, making sure they have capacity to, to engage because otherwise we're going to get the same voices again and again. Um, and you're going to build both digital and physical places that kind of don't work for everyone. So we've got a great question here that's about uh, basically whether we're measuring the right thing. Chelsea said that loneliness is only one aspect of social connection. So, you know, the Living Standards Framework uh, measures social connection based on how lonely people feel and the quantity of contact with friends and family, um, as well as feelings of discrimination. So people in communities might relate social connections to social reciprocity or to building uh, cultural identity. So are we measuring social connections in the right way? to uh so as to address it in all the aspects that matter to people shall i perhaps um have a first crack at that one because uh, i think that's a great question and when i was preparing the report um i thought about whether we should have in new zealand something that they have in the uk which is essentially um they have an, a national loneliness strategy or a strategy to eliminate loneliness and for a time they also had a minister responsible for loneliness although I think the way they're currently divvying up ministerial responsibilities there's no individual minister there anymore um, but and so you know because we've identified loneliness and lack of social connection as being a really important issue it's quite tempting to say okay we need a strategy to deal with this but I think when I thought about that more I thought actually it's not the right um, for for a national level strategy to um, address social connection, loneliness isn't the right frame to look through, even though I've written a whole report about it, um, because it's not holistic enough. It's negatively framed. It's, it's talking about a lack of something rather than the presence of something. And as, um, as Chelsea pointed out in that question, it's measuring some aspects of our social well-being, but not all aspects of them. So... Um, I actually think the fact that we've got uh, the government has got a well-being focus is really good because it's a more holistic um, measure of the different aspects of people's lives that contribute to well-being, and it's not framed negatively as being the lack of something rather than the presence of something. Um, but I guess in terms of how we measure social connection, I think one of the really interesting studies um, that I came across was one by um, researchers at Victoria University who looked at um, sort of cross-referencing people's measures of loneliness with their measure of how much they felt like they belonged in their community and um, how many uh, and whether they felt like they had people in their lives who understood and knew them well so it was looking not just at um, self-reported loneliness but uh, how well networked they were and how close they felt to the people around them. And and I think it's the combination of all of those three, three things. So um, the reassuring thing is the majority of people in that study, 58% reported both feeling like they belonged in their community and having people in their lives who knew and understood them. So that's great. We've, we've got starting from a good base. Most people do feel that those things are present in their lives. Um, but... Uh, those who felt that they, they perhaps had a place to stand or a sense of belonging in the community, but not people in their own lives who understood them well, um, fared worse than those who may have felt they didn't 
have a place to stand or a, a sense of belonging in the community, but that they did have people in their lives who knew them really, really well. So I guess that's a convoluted way of saying the same thing I said earlier, that it's the quality of our relationships and our connections with other people that is the most important thing for our well-being, um, as opposed to the quantity. So when we're thinking about ways to measure these subjective things, having an understanding of how well people's need for connection is being met by the relationships that they do have is really important because it's not necessarily um, it's not necessarily the number of people we know or the number of friends we have on Facebook or the number of um, you know loose connections we have, but the depth and quality of our individual relationships. Mm, kia ora Holly, and I, I guess I'd just like to add something because um, I did my master's thesis on well-being and it was from a psychology perspective. When I started working in economics, I noticed there wasn't a much of an overlap between um, the psychological perspective, which looks at subjective well-being, psychological functioning, which are mostly about the individual and their interaction with the world um, and with the social well-being. Social well-being only really started being explored in uh, the 90s. So there's not really a huge body of evidence um, so far around what metrics matter to people. Uh, so I think we've got a way to go and a, a bit to be developing in there, but I definitely agree that, that some kind of metrics that uh, also consider different cultural values um, are really important to be considering in a, in a bicultural country with a multicultural landscape. Um, Ooh, kia ora. and Pat, yeah, I should add, I meant to say before, I think there's a lot from Te Ao Māori that is very relevant in this space in terms of Māori understandings of kinship, whanaungatanga, whakapapa, and the role that these have in well-being, um, I think. Uh, in, in the context I used to work in, in, in children's rights and care protection, um, it's very apparent that the solutions that work well for Māori in that context are also the things that work well for everybody. So if everybody uh, has the opportunity to maintain their links to whakapapa and um, their whānau, and if everybody... Um, you know, everybody's relationships with Fado are fostered and built up, then we all do well whether we're Māori or not. So I think um, there's a, a real uh, opportunity to um, understand better and utilise concepts from Te Ao Māori in the, in the policy space as well. All right, tautoko that. Um, I guess I just, we've got one last question, I think, that kind of leads in well from this. Um, and this is from Anita. One group of people that can be lonely in my experience is migrants and international students. Um, so sometimes people hold the view that those from other countries just have to adapt to how it is here. Um, that's that kind of cultural exceptionalism, um, rather than integration being a two-way process. Do any of you have any experience in this cultural aspect of loneliness and approaches that help to counter it? Not really, but I can add a small, very kind of tangential bit around that. And again, in terms of uh, digital connections, I think that um, often when we think about kind of the accessibility of the digital world, we quite rightly think about making sure that uh, disabled people, often people that can't, uh, are blind or low vision, have access to the content that they need. But we also need to think about things about languages of content. So if you're going online in a new country and you don't speak English is your first language, is there accessible content in different languages? This was especially really uh, important over the lockdown and COVID-19, making sure that there were translations or information in the right format for people. So if you're coming from a country where you might not speak English, that you can engage and not expected, especially straight away, to be able to speak English and, uh, you know, um, engage in, I guess, the way that the, the majority of people might. Um, I just, um, I wondered, Karenia, if you wanted to speak about the student aspect of that from your research, um, but very briefly, I did see someone else had asked a question around the role of schools in combating loneliness, and um, I think for me it relates to this question too around, um, uh, you know, different cultures, and 
one of the wonderful things about the New Zealand school system when it's working well um, is that it's an opportunity for children from all different cultural, uh, religious, um, ethnic, family income, all types of backgrounds to be together and to form friendships and real strong bonds that hopefully last a long time and learn about each other's lives and what's different and what's the same. Um, and that's, you know, I think there's a real role for um, the public school system um, for not not for sort of integration and assimilation as perhaps historically it may have, um, you know, these policies may have focused on those aspects, but actually for building friendship, understanding and connection across a range of different backgrounds. And so I, I remain hopeful that our schools, um, if people continue to um, mix with each other in diverse school populations have a real role to play there. I wondered, Karinia, whether this would be a good time to maybe talk about the work you've been doing around student accommodation, because a lot of uh, international students, um, which are not there's not a huge amount right now, but hopefully they'll come back. You know, a lot of students uh, come into the uh, student accommodation. So, uh, are you able to talk more about the work you're doing with student accommodation and how to increase social connection through there? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Amanda. Uh, so just very briefly, the uh, the research was co-funded by WSP and the Victoria University School of Architecture. It was co-supervised by Dr. Jan Smither and myself. And um, Anya um, Seth was the student who conducted the research. And basically what it looked at was it, it took student accommodation in the tertiary sector as a case study for looking at how can design enhance the well-being and and also alleviate loneliness. And it looked at the, the same data that Holly um, looked at in terms of the, the age group model only. Um, and it, it, was, it was a fantastic research that looked at a design framework. So it's saying, what can design do in a practical sense to say, um, to make people happier, to make people feel connected. And so looking at student accommodation, uh, for example, here in Wellington, it's a very common thing to convert an old office building into student accommodation. And that's just the reality of the, you know, what's available and, and what's going on in the market at the moment. But the, the issues that we face there is that there's already a very set structural system and I'm talking about columns and, and beams and things that was designed for an office. So what happens when you are trying to design rooms, just trying to design corridors and uh, community spaces or common rooms that allow people to engage? And it's, it's from my experience and having lived in a um, hall as well, it's not quite there. And there's a lot of opportunities missed where a student could literally get into a lift and go straight up to their room and not see a single person. You know, the, the design actually allows them to disengage and be quite um, isolated. So what is the design? Uh, how can the design turn that around? And that's what Anya's research really looked at is looking at color, looking at um, what, do, what does pattern do? How can you redesign the common room so everyone that enters and exits the building must walk past a group of people having fun or you know, socializing? And what does that do to them in terms of making the decision whether to join them or not? So it's, it's really interesting looking at that application. We're actually moving it across into the education sector as well, which, which Holly talked about. And it's really looking at what exactly is, um, we can't stop our children going to school. That's just not, it's not a thing. It's, we need to get them engaged. It's, it's looking at, you know, the um, new, new people into, into Aotearoa as well. So what is it about the school furniture that makes them, they can still be semi-socially distanced, but they can have a really good yarn to each other or discussion over drawing a picture or something. So it, it's kind of that micro scale of what is happening in, uh, in the classroom or what's happening in the, um, in the student accommodation setting. Kia ora, Karenia. 
I, there are so many amazing questions in here and I wish we had time to be able to answer them all today because I feel like we've really only just touched the surface uh, of, of what we could be doing and what our world could look like if there was uh, more digital equity, uh, more neighbourhoods that encouraged and buildings that encouraged social connection and if people had enough money to be able to live and to thrive. Um, so I'll just hand it over to Holly for some uh, last comments before we wrap up today. Well, kia ora Amanda and um, kia ora to all three of you, Max, Anna and Karenia. Um, thank you so much for engaging so um, deeply with this topic and I and I've really enjoyed the conversation um I think for me like the thing that I'm taking away from this and which is really encouraging is the to take three topics that um, may seem on the face of it to be quite separate so income policy and and equity and poverty uh, digital inclusion and design of, of our streets and neighborhoods they fear they can seem like very three very different topics but it's really heartening to hear the connections between the three of them and the ways that we could bring design thinking inclusive design thinking um into all three of those policy areas to really make a difference to people's lives and to enhance social connections so thank you for engaging on it um really openly and thinking about the connections between the different topics um, for, I, I've written down a few points of summary, but the main ones are really thinking about how we design our policy, design our physical world, and design our digital world um, with, by, and for the people affected. And if we did that um, across all of these three areas, I think we would be um, we would have a significantly different um, picture to be talking about in terms of people's levels of social connectedness and well-being and I hope we do do those things and have the opportunity to have that conversation in the future with things much better um, designed for for the people whose lives are actually affected by the policy decisions that are made so thank you very much and also I really want to thank um, WSP and Burl and you Amanda for your excellent facilitation it's been a real pleasure to work with the three um, organisations to bring this webinar together today and thank you very much um, for your excellent um, stewarding of our conversation, Amanda. Mm. Kia ora Holly. Um, and again, I'd like to totoko that thank you to our panellists, Karenia, Max and Anna. Like if I take one thing away from our corridor today, it's that we need to design for accessibility and accessibility means a lot of different things. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your time, your energy, your contributions. I'd like to thank Holly for weaving uh, all of the strands together and for pivoting to an online event in our level two world. Um, and also for, for the research that's really highlighting something that's, that's quite dear to my heart, which is social connection and social capital. Like we have that, that, uh, that, that uh, whakatauki, which is, you know, that people always pull out that one bit, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata, that it's about the people. But there's a whole bunch before that that's really around how we nurture and care for people um, in a way that ensures that, that uh, we have a better future for uh, for our children for tomorrow and a better future, a uh, better present for them today. Um, so, and I'd like to thank all of you for watching out there. Thank you for your interest in making Aotearoa a more socially connected and less lonely place. Uh, nō reira, kati mō tēnei wā, uh, kei a koutou te wā, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, Tēnā tato katoa. I'll just end with a karakia today. Uh, unuhia, unuhia, te pau, te pau. Kia wātia, kia wātia, ai rā kua wātia. Tuturu whakamaua ki a tēnā. Haumie, huie, tai ki e. Okay. Haere rā koutou.